moving into chapter 34 and 35 of Isaiah this week. Thus far in Isaiah, we've seen a pattern develop in how Isaiah has been delivering these oracles. Usually they start with judgment followed by a blessing, followed by judgment, followed by blessing. And sometimes the judgments, well, if you look, the judgments seem to be growing more and more severe as we're moving into the book. The blessings usually center around something to deal or something to do with the coming Messiah uh, or the redemption, restoration of Israel and the establishment of the Messianic kingdom. And we saw initially the judgments that were being pronounced were being pronounced against the northern kingdom, uh, Israel or Ephraim, and, and the southern kingdom of Judah. And then they started expanding to the nations surrounding Ephraim and Judah. And eventually we saw some dealing with judgments of the entire world. And as we're in this section where we are right now, we started in chapter 28, be concluding today, we've seen this same pattern develop here. Israel, Judah, blessings, Israel, Judah, blessings, and then Assyria, Egypt. And now as we get into chapter 34, we're seeing once again these judgments being pronounced against the whole earth. And they've grown in severity. So that's what we're dealing with in chapter 34, more judgments. But then as we conclude in chapter 35, we see once again these, this oracle of blessing, dealing with what will be coming in the Messianic kingdom. But before we get into that, I just briefly want to go back and revisit something that I've read several times, which is that passage in Romans, Romans chapter 1, verses 18 to 25, where Paul writes this, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God, nor gave thanks to Him, but their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being, and birds, and animals, and reptiles. Hold on to that. The human being, birds, and animals, and reptiles. Therefore God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the Creator who is forever praised. Amen. I truly believe there is an innate knowledge and understanding of the Lord God Almighty in every person who has ever walked on the face of the earth. I think that's what Paul is saying here. God will never force anyone to serve him, but he will encourage everyone to seek him and to seek a saving knowledge of him. And I think if we each look back in our lives, we can see those times when we might have been straying from the path, the narrow path that Jesus talked about in the Sermon on the Mount. We've strayed from that and we felt the loving hand of God kind of nudge us back onto that straight and narrow path that leads to the narrow gate. And for some of us, it's been more than a gentle nudge. It's been an outright, well, I like to call it a royal, a holy two by four which I have felt on one or two occasions. But keep in mind, and I think this is what Paul is really saying here, God will not unjustly condemn anyone because everyone has the same basic inborn knowledge and understanding of who God is. So with that thought in mind, get into chapter 34. I'll be reading from the New American Standard this morning because I think the New American Standard 
better captures the forcefulness of these prophecies. Chapter 34, verse 1. Draw near, O nations, to hear and listen, O peoples. Let the earth and all its contents hear, and the world and all that springs from it. So the Lord is speaking to all the peoples of the earth here, all the nations of the earth. And as we see when we get into verse 2, that what the Lord is essentially doing is issuing an invitation to judgment. No RSVP will be necessary because the Lord Almighty is not expecting people to come to him. He's coming to earth and he's coming to earth to pour out his wrath. I believe this chapter is looking forward to that time just preceding the Messiah's return, talking about that period we call the Great Tribulation just prior to the establishment of the Lord's millennial kingdom on earth. This is verse 2. For the Lord's indignation is against all the nations and his wrath against all their armies. He has utterly destroyed them. He has given them over to slaughter. So their slain will be thrown out and their corpses will give off their stench and the mountains will be drenched with their blood. This describes the extent of the Lord's judgment on the earth. All the nations and all their armies are about to be judged. Verse 2 says he has utterly destroyed them. He has given them over to slaughter. The Hebrew word translated utterly destroyed, haram, a more literal translation would be put under the ban. Now, a lot of times we see the word ban and we think something's been forbidden. This, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the term being put under the ban, but it goes back into earlier times when ban, in this case being used as a noun, talked about essentially being doomed. So the idea being is that if you're put under the ban, you're essentially about to be judged for something that you've done. And usually this was a situation where you were presumed guilty until you could prove yourself innocent. So that's really this utterly destroyed, this word haram, that's really the meaning it's carrying, doomed or put under the ban. The idea being these nations have in essence already been judged and found guilty and are now awaiting what it said at the conclusion of that sentence, he has given them over to slaughter. They're awaiting this judgment being now executed. The extent of this judgment we see beginning in verse three. So their slain will be thrown out and their corpses will give off their stench and the mountains will be drenched with their blood. Then continuing in verse 4, And all the host of heaven will wear away, and the sky will be rolled up like a scroll. All their host will also wither away, as a leaf withers from the vine, or as one withers from the fig tree. Verse 4 speaks of the host of heaven, and often when we hear that term, the host of heaven or the heavenly host, we think of angels, God's holy angels. But that word which is Saba Saba'a, can also be translated stars. So the host of heaven can also refer to stars. And oftentimes we see stars metaphorically representing angels. And it talks then about these being all the host of heaven, think all the stars will wear, will wear away. The sky will be rolled up like a scroll. All their host will also wither. Remember that there are both holy angels and fallen angels, or if you will, unholy angels. And so that word, Saba Saba'a, can refer to not only God's holy angels in the sky, but also God's fallen angels, demons being represented by these stars. The spiritual forces behind these idolatrous 
religions, I believe, are these fallen angels, these demons. I cannot believe that someone would fall down and worship a stone idol if there wasn't something there. People do not get involved in these idolatrous religions or these pagan religions without something being there. So there is a spiritual force there that these people who are abandoning God and walking into these pagan and idolatrous religions are feeling on that spiritual level. Remember, the Apostle Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. And these forces, these unholy hosts of heaven, I think in part is what's being talked about here. So when these stars fall from heaven, I think we're seeing an allusion to the fallen angels who were cast out of heaven. We see that picture in the book of Revelation. And the sky being rolled up in some of these idolatrous religions of the Near East, ancient Near East, some of their gods were associated with the sky. So I think what we're seeing here in this initial opening, talking about God coming against these spiritual forces that Paul talks about, spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places, God first coming against them. Verse 5, My sword is satiated in heaven. Behold, it shall descend for judgment upon Edom and upon the people whom I have devoted to destruction. So the Lord God now brings this sword of judgment, this sword of judgment and justice against those people who have devoted themselves to the worship of this unholy host of heaven. Again, the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. And the Lord singles out Edom. Now, if you recall, Edom was the people that were the descendants of Esau, who was Jacob's brother. And Edom is being used metaphorically here because they have for generations been Israel's enemies. And remember that Israel is Jacob. So Edom represents the brother of Israel coming against the children of Israel or the children of Jacob. So we see, I think, Edom here being used metaphorically to represent all of the enemies of Israel, all those who stand in opposition to God and to God's people. And then verse 5 concludes, and upon the people with whom I have devoted to destruction would seem to indicate that it's more than just this nation of Edom, but the whole world. Verse 6, the sword of the Lord is filled with blood. It is sated with fat, with the blood of lambs and goats, with the fat of the kidneys of rams. For the Lord has a sacrifice in Basra. Basra was the capital of Edom. And a great slaughter in the land of Edom. Again, representing the whole earth. Wild oxen will also fall with them, and young bulls with strong ones. Thus their land will be soaked with blood, and their dust become greasy with fat. And I think what we're seeing here now is we're beginning to see the full force and power of the Lord's fury against those who have stood in opposition to him. The sword of judgment and justice the Lord is wielding is described as filled with blood. And to me, this almost seems to be talking about the blood of martyrs, those who have died in the cause of God and since the time of Christ in the cause of Christ. This further describes this sword being sated with fat and blood of lambs and goats and with the fat of the kidneys of rams. And I see this as kind of indicating all of these sacrifices that have been made from the time of Moses in the tabernacle 
to the, into the time of David and Solomon when the temple was built. And then in the temple, during this 15, 1600 year period where these sacrifices were made. And then since the coming of Christ, all the sacrifices that have been made by those who truly are seeking God through Christ in their cause of Christ, all the sacrifices made there, all of this being now wrapped up and rolled into this sword of righteousness, this sword of justice that the Lord is now bringing in judgment as he pours out his wrath on the earth. Verse 7 shows the extent of the devastation of his wrath because even the livestock and the land itself will be devastated. And then verse 8, this is a beautiful verse. Verse 8 explains the why of all this. For the Lord has a day of vengeance, a year of recompense for the cause of Zion. A day of vengeance, a year of recompense for the cause of Zion. And remember, Zion is the mountain upon which Jerusalem sits. Zion is the mountain upon which the temple of God sits or sat. And I think what this is saying here is this time of judgment, which I believe corresponds to, that, to the Great Tribulation, this time of judgment is to return to Israel's enemies. And by extension, since the Gentiles who have come to God through Christ are grafted in to Israel, this time of judgment is there to compensate the Jewish people, the remnant, the cause, the church, the remnant, those who truly have been serving God and seeking God, his kingdom and his righteousness. This period of judgment is to compensate them for all they have suffered at the hands of the ungodly and the unrighteous. Not a good time to not be one of God's people. And starting in verse 9, the Lord continues to describe the full extent of this devastation of his wrath. Its streams, its being this area coming under judgment, its streams will be turned to pitch and its loosened earth into brimstone and its land will become burning pitch. It will not be quenched night or day. Its smoke will go up forever from generation to generation It will be desolate. None will pass through it forever and ever. But pelican and hedgehog will possess it, and owl and raven will dwell in it. And he will stretch over it the line of desolation and the plumb line of emptiness. Its nobles, there is no one there whom they may proclaim king, and all its princes will be nothing. The thorns will come up from its fortified towers, nettles and thistles in its fortified cities. It will also be a haunt of jackals and an abode of ostriches. The desert creatures will meet with wolves. The hairy goat will also cry to its kind. Yes, the night monster will settle there and will find herself a resting place. The tree snake will make its nest and lay eggs there, and it will hatch and gather them under its protection. Yes, The hawks will be gathered there, every one with its kind. Do you get a sense of just how devastating these judgments against the Lord's enemies will be? Verse 9 shows a level of destruction unseen in the scriptures. And it's a description that almost parallels, if not exceeds, what we saw in the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Brimstone is an ancient term or archaic term for sulfur. So it's describing burning sulfur, which is not a comfortable thing to be around. Did you make it out to Yellowstone on your trip? You know that beautiful aroma? Sulfitari. Yeah, our sulfitari in Naples, the same thing, that beautiful aroma of burning sulfur. Verse 10 tells us this fire will never be quenched. And I believe this is a clear indication that when the Lord God finally pours 
the full fury of his wrath against his enemies, against the enemies of the remnant of his people, against the enemies of his church. It will put an end to all those who have stood in opposition to God. Verses 11 through 13 describe the land so devastated that it will only be fit for these unclean animals that are described. And verse 12 reinforces this idea. It says it's nobles. There will be no one there whom they may proclaim king and all its princes will be nothing. Not, not a living soul is going to remain in this area coming under the full fury of the wrath of God. And what's interesting in verse 14, we read, yes, the night monster will settle there and will find herself a resting place. The word translated night monster is the Hebrew word Lilith. I don't know how much you know about Lilith. Lilith is an interesting study. You ever heard anything about Lilith? Lilith in some circles is thought to have been Adam's first wife who was cast out of Eden because she would not submit to her husband, Adam. But in the folklore and mythology of many of the Middle Eastern or Near Eastern, ancient Near Eastern cultures, Lilith was also seen as a very powerful demon or demoness and is often associated with Satan. It's thought in some places that Lilith may have actually been the wife of Satan. And that's this night monster. That's how the word actually meet, Lilith in Hebrew means night monster or night hag and was considered a very powerful and you didn't want to meet her in a dark alley kind of demon. So given that, and then given the description of these unclean animals that we've just gone through, I think it's quite possible that these unclean animals, as Paul talked about in that passage in Romans, that they had given up God for the worship of idols carved out of people, Lilith, and animals and reptiles and so forth, that these animals don't represent actual animals, but the demonic spirits behind these idols that, were, that had grown up around these idolatrous and pagan religions of the ancient Near East. I think what this is saying is that this devastation of God in this land is going to be so great that the only thing capable of inhabiting these lands, these devastated lands, are not unclean animals, but unclean spirits. Demons are fallen angels. And I think most likely the spirits of the unrighteous dead. Verse 16, seek from the book of the Lord and read, not one of these will be missing. None will lack its mate, for his mouth has commanded and his spirit has gathered them. He has cast the lot for them and his hand has divided it to them by line. They shall possess it forever from generation to generation. They will dwell in it. Verse 16, seek from the book, the scriptures, Seek from the book of the Lord and read, not one of these will be missing. And I think what God is saying here is that these prophecies of God will come to pass. And in part, I think the Lord is making a challenge to those who are able to read these prophecies after the fact and look back and see that, in fact, every one of them had come to pass. And I also think we are seeing here in this description of this land so devastated. We're seeing a precursor of hell, the lake of fire described by the Apostle John in the book of Revelation, that place where fallen angels and the unrighteous dead, the unrighteous dead, all who knew better, thinking back to what Paul wrote in Romans, will be cast because of their total rejection of the Lord God. Then we move into chapter 35, 
And chapter 35 then gives us this promise. Chapter 35, starting in verse 1, The wilderness and the desert will be glad, and the Arabah will rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It will blossom profusely and rejoice with rejoicing and shout of joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it. The majesty of Carmel and Sharon, they will see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. The lands that have been devastated by wars and to some extent by the pouring out of the wrath of God will be restored. And I think we see as we work through this chapter, they'll be restored presumably for the return of the redeemed of the Lord. Of course, the Arabah, that area south of the Dead Sea. Carmel and Sharon described in an early, I think last week we talked about that being devastated. These will be restored. And they'll be restored to the point where they're beyond anything we could imagine today. Verse 3, encourage the exhausted and strengthen the fable. Say to those with anxious heart, take courage, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. The recompense of God will come, but he will save you. So the restoration of the land. And now here we have the promise of redemption to the righteous, the righteous remnant. Verse 5, then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. Then the lame will leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute will shout for joy. Healing of the land, redemption of the people, and now healing of the people. Then verse 6 continues. For waters will break forth in the wilderness and streams in the Arabah. The scorched land will become a pool and the thirsty ground springs of water. In the haunt of jackals, its resting place, grass becomes reeds and rushes. This dry, desolate, desert area that comprises so much of the Holy Lands will blossom, will be rich, will be well watered, will never again face drought. And then verse 7 is an interesting way of confirming this because the jackal, the haunt of the jackal, its resting place, grass becomes reeds and rushes. Jackals tend to live in arid areas, similar to the coyote. They can survive elsewhere, but they tend to prefer arid areas. And the haunt and resting place of jackals then would be these arid grasslands. And it says, grass becomes reeds and rushes. Reeds and rushes re require lots of water, lakes, rivers. So this sentence further confirms just how much these lands will flow with plentiful water because the arid haunt of the jackals, these arid grasslands, will be able to grow reeds and rushes. Verse 8, a highway will be there, a roadway, and it will be called the highway of holiness. The unclean will not travel on it, but it will be for him who walks that way, the way of the Lord, and fools will not wander on it. No lion will be there, nor will any vicious beast go up on it. These will not be found there, but the redeemed will walk there. So a highway or roadway will be created called the highway of holiness. I think the straight and narrow path Jesus speaks of in the Sermon on the Mount. And this highway will be for the exclusive use of the redeemed, the righteous remnant, the people of God. There will be nothing to fear on this road, nothing to hinder those who are on this path. And if there were any doubt why any of this that we've seen here in chapter 35, if there's any doubt why any of this is being done, we have verse 10. And I think this is one of my favorite verses in all of the book of Isaiah. And the ransomed of the Lord will return and come with joyful shouting to Zion, with everlasting joy upon their heads. 
They will find gladness and joy, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. The redeemed of the Lord will return with joyful singing into Zion, Jerusalem, the holy city, the place where Messiah will sit upon the restored Davidic throne. They will return with everlasting joy upon their heads. They will find, as they return to Zion, gladness and joy. Sorrow and sighing will flee away. Everyone who has ever walked upon the earth will, in time, receive their just rewards. The righteous remnant into the messianic kingdom. Those who have chosen to reject God and oppose, persecute, martyr God's people, they will be cast out of his presence. Those who have chosen to seek God and his righteousness, those who have chosen to serve and worship the Lord God Almighty, when they stand upon this highway of holiness and return to Zion, will hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. They will be welcomed into the Lord's presence in the Messianic Kingdom and eventually into the New Jerusalem. Any questions? Next section of Isaiah begins in chapter 36. We've talked about it a couple of times, maybe more than that. This is a historical narrative of the life and times of King Hezekiah. Start that next week. Thank you.